All right, folks, so here is a short lecture on medieval theater. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, medieval theater. Uh, so the medieval times, the Dark Ages, uh, started as the fall of the Holy Roman Empire, right? So the Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century CE. Um, the Roman Catholic Church was prevalent, right? The Roman Catholic Church had grown under, under Rome's power and kind of spread out across Europe. Um, what's really interesting at this time was that no country had kind of um, major government. There was no centralized power in Europe, right? And so the Roman Catholic Church um, took advantage of this and started to act as advisors to the numerous small kingdoms throughout Europe. Um, and what this allowed them to do was to really control, and the Roman Catholic Church actually ended up becoming kind of the centralized government in Europe in Europe during this time, right? They were the ones really controlling things with archbishops and bishops who had kings and rulers' ears. Um, so the Roman Catholic Church was monotheistic, very different from Egyptians and Greeks and Romans, um, right? The, uh, the Roman Catholic Church thought that theater was immoral, right? It was a distraction from the piety that the church demanded, right? So the church ran into a problem at this time. It was the fact that their services were all in Latin, that they weren't able to spread the word to the common people, right? Because church services were in Latin, it wasn't very exciting to go and sit there for three hours and not be able to understand what was happening, right? So the church started to fall back on the idea of rituals and presentations, just like the Egyptians, just like the Greeks, right? These early presentations um, were liturgical dramas or tropes, embellishments sung during mass. Um, they believed, uh, it's believed that they were to have been sung by four clergies, clergymen, um, and they represented the three martyrs at Jesus's tomb and the fourth was an angel, right? Cam Caertus is one of the earliest and the oldest um, tropes that is still in existence and was usually part of an Easter celebration. Um, it created early dialogue and started to grow into a much larger event, right? These tropes, these liturgical dramas were there to teach religious history, right? And at this point, only the, the clergy was performing and they were only staged inside the church. This is very similar to how Greek theater developed, right? But later on, the festival of Corpus Christi, right, was the first, um, the, the first Thursday of, um, after Easter was a huge celebration to celebrate the doctrine that priests can, can consecrate the host, right? So the belief that priests are able to turn bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus. That's a really like central idea to the Catholic faith, right? So the feast of Corpus Christi started around the 13th century in Belgium. Um, this festival became a major feast of the Catholic Church and it grew to be very large, it grew to be very large in lots of communities. Um, there were processions and pageants and it became a community-wide event that eventually helped fuel the excitement of theater, right? And as this excitement for theater began to grow and as these festivals began to grow, the, 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 the theater that was being made moved away from the worshiping service, right? It moved outside of the church into the church courtyards. Townspeople began to act and produce, right? Everyone was becoming, but, but was, was being part of this, um, this, this formation of theater. And again, it's this human nature, this need to tell stories. Um, what's really important is that the stories were still religious subjects, right? And they developed three forms of theater at this time. The miracle plays, the mystery plays, and the morality plays, right? So what are the miracle plays? The miracle plays were um, often about helping those in need. Um, and um, they were usually um, based on the miracles performed by the saints in the Bible, right? They came around again around late 12th century and they st we started to see miracle plays all over Christian Europe, right? The saving of a sinner sold by the saints, right? Um, 
most English texts have been lost of the miracle plays because of Henry VIII's split with the Catholic Church, um, you know, and the, the, the early Reformation in the 16th century um, and the Catholic Church almost completely being run out of, uh, of England is really why we lost a lot of the English texts of these miracle plays. Um, we still have mystery plays, right? And the mystery plays were, again, religious subjects. Um, and they were developed by clergy, um, and they began to dramatize the mysteries of Christ's passion, right? But guilds, right, guilds were these um, groups of craftsmen that had special skills that were a mystery to everyone else, right? So like the Carpenter's Guild and the Water Drawer's Guild and the Butcher's Guild, all of these things, all of these places, right, all of these groups of people had these special skills that you had to learn, from the guild and you couldn't learn how to do these things unless you were part of the guild, um, right? And so these craft guilds started to produce plays that could be associated with their mystery, their skill. Um, an example uh, is the butchers might do um, a mystery about the temptations of Christ. The shipbuilders would do a play about the building of the ark and they would really pull from the entire Old Testament and New Testament and um, really explore the mysteries of the Bible. Um, the mystery plays were done in cycles every year, um, and these were groups of plays that were 24 to 48 plays that really told the story of the Bible from beginning to end. Um, and they were usually named after the districts where they were performed. Um, there were four cycles are still preserved, the York cycle, um, the Chester cycle, the Townley cycle, and the N-Town cycle. N-Town was a generic version that could be done anywhere. Um, and these were performed over and over and over again. And there's actually one of the videos that you're also going to watch is about um, the York mystery plays being redeveloped and being produced every four years in York, England. So morality plays came around last, right? These started to come around in the late 14th and 15th century. Um, they were not part of the cycles. These were independent moral tales. Um, they were abstract battles between certain vices and specific virtues for the possession of the human soul, um, right? They weren't about the saints or the mysteries of the Bible. They weren't stories that were directly from the Bible, but they were about real everyday people facing temptation in the world, right? The devil's everywhere and constantly trying to steal, steal your soul. So these plays were almost like dramatized surgeons or sermons, right? So they were, they were these, these stories to tell tales and to teach people how to be a good person right? It wasn't about the Bible. It was about every person's soul and how to be a good, decent person. And it warned that your soul was already always in danger. Right? Um, some of the things that developed, two major things that developed in the morality plays was allegory, right? And this was a really wonderful medieval device. Um, and an allegory is the idea of giving abstract ideas, values, um, and a physical representation. So what does that mean? If we look at the picture right here, this, this, sculpt, um, this sculpture represents justice, right? Lady Justice. She has scales because she's fair and balanced. She's wearing a blindfold because justice is blind, and she carries a sword so that she can deal out justice swiftly and as it's... Um, as it's decided, right? So that's the idea of justice given physical representation, right? So playwrights personified abstract values. Um, the idea that sloth would show a man reclining lazily and greed or gluttony might be a fat man constantly like gorging himself um, or uh, vanity is someone absorbed within a mirror, right? Using an allegory to represent abstract qualities allowed playwrights to draw clear-cut lines of moral force. Satan, bad. Angels, good. Um, and then the other thing that came about was the didactic play, a play that aimed at teaching a moral lesson. Um, so as you read um, Prosvita's Dulcidius, think about, is this a mystery play? 
is this a morality play or is this a miracle play? And think about that. Um, so the early stage during the medieval times, you know, it originated in the church and moved outside. And it was originally, it, 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 it finally became dependent upon pageant wagons, right? These flat surfaces drawn on wheels, often elevated on which scenes were acted out. Actors used levels. The upper level was the clouds, right? The audience level was the underworld, right? Um, so like there were three levels. And if you look at this scene, you can see you've got angels up here and you have demons down here and you have humans in the middle. So it was really heaven, hell, and earth that they were trying to represent. Um, there was a, usually a curtain below or behind the space that allowed for costume changes, um, the devils were comedic and grotesque and very funny during this time. Some of these pageant wagons would have the mouth of hell or a fish-shaped hole from which smoke and explosions would come from, and they would, like, belch. And sometimes the they would be so elaborately built that they took 17 men to operate. Um, a very simple structure, right, if we can look here. We've got um, a, a section view, and then we have a, so a section view is looking at it from the side, and a plan view is looking at it from the top, right? So we've got two wagons next to each other. We have like a loft up here, we have cloth down here, we have a playing space, and we have the ability to really kind of shape um, how they're going to tell the story and how they're going to use this theater that they've created, this portable rolling theater. Um, we've got some other images of some pageant wagons, some artist representations of what pageant wagons may have looked like. Again, you know, we've got kind of the different levels, um, and they're, again, very religious. Um, here's a simple one with a very, very complex hell mouth, right? And you can see what they were doing over here. All right, so that's a little bit about medieval theater. Um, read Dulcidius and then move on to the next video about Dulcidius. Thanks a lot.